In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seed of Wisdom, pray for us, St. Matthew. Pray for us, St. Jerome. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky... Hold on. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. <clears throat> when the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, <coughs> Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they discussed it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus aware of this, said, O men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to perceive that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to, to beware of the heaven leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do... <coughs> who do men say that the son of man is and they said some say john the baptist others say elijah and others jeremiah or one of the prophets he said to them but who do you say that i am simon peter replied you are the christ the son of the living god and Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. <clears throat> then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. 
You are not on the side of God, but of men. <clears throat> then Jesus told his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> All right, folks, so, yeah, this is going to be a long haul, and uh, chapter 16 warrants it, though. We have to take our time with this chapter. This is a foundational chapter, as you will see. Uh, it's going to ground the divine identity of our Lord, his divinity. We're going to nail that down in this chapter. Who do you say that I am? That is the question for us and for the entire human race for all time. Also, the grounding of the Catholic Church on this foundation that we're going to see was fully intended by our Lord uh, to be none other than Peter, the rock. Okay, so we're going to spend a lot of time on those two things. Uh, those two aspects of this chapter are of huge importance for Christianity and the Catholic faith in particular. So let's get right into it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are how we begin. They come to test or tempt our Lord, uh, asking him for a sign. Now, the word pyrazo, we've come across it before, and it can be translated test or tempt. Tempt implies something malicious, okay, versus test. God tempts no man, but he does test us <coughs> as he tested Abraham. Um he tests all of us. Uh, how do we translate it then? Well, most translations, you know, use test. Uh, but some, like the King James, uh, use tempt. And other more literal translations, the Young's literal and the standard, hold on, the literal standard versions, I found a, three temptations at least that translate that word as tempt. I like that personally. I think they are tempting him. Uh, they're sounding an awful lot like back in chapter 4 when the devil, the tempter, when you put that uh, definite article in front of that word pyrazo, the hawk pyrazo is the tempter. We know who that is. And he approached our Lord in the wilderness and gave him a very similar temptation when he took him up uh, to the pinnacle of the temple and said, why don't you throw yourself down and dazzle this crowd with a sign or a miracle? So it seems like the Pharisees and Sadducees here are tempting our Lord in a very similar fashion. Hence, I like that particular translation. But our Lord's not going to fall for it, just as he didn't fall for it when the devil tried that trick. Okay, These guys are blind guides. Our Lord has already said, and he's going to say again, that they're blind guides uh, because they cannot read the signs of the times. Yeah, sure, they can read the signs and forecast the weather, the physical realities around us. No problem. That's easy compared to the signs of the times are something that implies meaning. All right. So we got to make a distinction here between two Greek words for time, one being chronos, all right, like a chronometer I have strapped to my wrist, as many of us do tells time okay counts it tick tock tick tock tick tock minutes days weeks years months so on up but then there's kairos time which ultimately it derives from the greek word kara which means head it's when something comes to a head it's a time that is opportune or ripe uh the ripe moment or season the timely moment the suitable or favorable moment, the appointed time or season when something is in due season, when it is coming to a head. It is Kairos time. It implies meaning and purpose and plan. 
Um, <clears throat> that's the kind of time that our Lord is talking about here. You don't know the signs of the times in the sense of Kairos. They can't read the prophetic signs. They don't have this prophetic vision. They are blind guides. They're supposed to be the experts in authority on sacred scripture. Are they reading sacred scripture? Because in Daniel chapter 9, we have that famous prophecy that the archangel Gabriel delivered to the prophet Daniel when he told him that in 490 years or 70 weeks of years, uh, there's going to be an anointed one who's going to deliver the world from transgression. He's going to remove transgression and he's going to be cut off which is a Hebrew way of saying he's going to be put to death. Uh, so this is the archangel Gabriel telling us that this anointed one is going to come in 490 years to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, and he will be cut off, executed. And when should we start the clock ticking on this incredibly important prophetic text? Well, he tells us, the archangel says, start the clock ticking when this decree goes out. Because remember, Daniel is in the Babylonian captivity at the time. He's in Babylon. All right. So the archangel tells him, when the official decree comes down, sending you back to refound the temple, uh, that's when you can start the clock on this prophecy of the 490 years. Well, we can see in Ezra chapter 7 uh, that this is going to be Artaxerxes, this Persian king, is going to, you'll, you can read his official decree in chapter 7 of the book of Ezra in the Old Testament, and we can date that from extra biblical sources. We know that's 457 or 458, with a pretty strong degree of certitude about that. Well, subtract 490 from 457, what do you get? 33 AD. Okay, so the signs of the times, man, something is coming to a head here, our Lord is basically implying. Are they realizing that? Uh, are they reading the scriptures? Uh, yeah, it, it boggles the mind. I mean, the people themselves were in expectation, according to Luke 3.15. The people were in expectation. That's why they're asking John the Baptist, are you Elijah? Are you the Christ? Are you the prophet like Moses that was foretold to come in Deuteronomy 18? Something's going down, and the people know that. And here, these guys don't seem to be clued in. Uh, why? Because they didn't know the time of their visitation. That is a chilling statement in Luke 19.44. Uh, you did not know the time of your visitation that was promised in the prophet Isaiah 29, 6. In an instant, suddenly you will be visited by the Lord. Here is this visit. They are there with the Messiah. And they can't read the signs of the times. They are blind guides. Uh, now, I think in modern times, there's a certain blindness as I was reflecting on this. Uh, yeah, maybe the simple fact that in this age of science, these modern times that we live in where people place such high value on those who are experts in the hard sciences, be it physics, astronomy, biology, geology, whatever it is, look, we're fascinated by them, and uh, but the physical universe can't tell us why it exists can't answer questions of meaning. The hard sciences aren't going to tell us who we are. They don't reveal purpose, plan, uh, for us, or meaning. Um, so, yeah, we need to return to Kairos uh, vision or prophetic vision. Now, let's segue from there um, and talk about the sign of Jonah that our Lord is talking about to them. He says, you're only going to get the sign of Jonah. You want a prophetic sign? I'll give you one. Sign of Jonah. We've already talked about that because it came up in chapter 12, the sign of Jonah, but basically the resurrection and the conversion of the Gentiles. 
That's what's going to happen as a result of this passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, and this rapid spread, growth, and development of Christianity. Okay, uh, <clears throat> it is going to be like a new sign of Jonah. Uh, <clears throat> that that was just a preview, a foreshadowing, ultimately, in that prophet Jonah, in his story, uh, is just the merest reflection of this tremendous um, sign that is going to be given through this new Jonah, somebody who our Lord says is he himself is greater than Jonah, something greater than Jonah here, right? Uh, it's not just going to be resuscitated and, and save or rescue uh, Nineveh, uh, one people in one city. He's gonna, he's gonna be resurrected in a glorified body, and he's gonna bring down or accomplish a worldwide evangelization for all time, uh, far exceeding the prophet Jonah. So twice in Matthew you hear our Lord refer to the sign of Jonah. Once in Luke, and there's something similar that our Lord says in the second chapter of John's Gospel when he says to the Pharisees and Sadducees or the high priest or whatever. He's like, look, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it again. Um, kind of similar reference uh, to the resurrection. So the Jews, they demand signs. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.22. And they're going to get the sign of Jonah. Now he gets into the boat with the apostles. And... <clears throat> starts talking about this leaven and they think he's talking about bread all right because they don't have vision either it's very interesting to me that our lord kind of remonstrates them uh for being men of little faith um usually we think of faith as like assent to a article of the creed uh, or some proposition of the faith some doctrine of the faith but faith is more than that uh, our Lord here is saying, you men, you lack spiritual or supernatural vision. They're not seeing the deeper meaning of what our Lord is talking about, and they lack faith. Uh, they have little faith. So the teaching is what our Lord was talking about. The teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is a leavening that uh, is going to have to be rooted out. The Council of Jerusalem is going to go a long way to help do that. Uh, and the ministry of Paul and the apostles, um, they're going to combat this leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, their teaching. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, Luke says in chapter 12, verse 1, that the uh, leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees is in fact hypocrisy. All right, but uh, but anyway, the teaching here and chapter five of First Corinthians verses six to eight, I want to make mention of here uh, because Saint Paul talks about leaven also, and it's very interesting what he says. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So, yeah, you hear different uses of this metaphor, leaven, back in chapter 13, Matthew, uh, records our Lord's use of that metaphor to describe the kingdom of God. It's like a woman in three measures of flour mixes in this leaven and it leavens the whole dough. So there's a positive sense, but here our Lord's talking about a negative sense of this metaphor leaven, the, the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees or their hypocrisy. And St. Paul says here, so uh, it's fascinating how he's, he uses that same metaphor that our Lord used and makes the same basic point and says that we are to be unleavened bread, unleavened bread, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, because uh, leaven puffs up. Uh, so, yeah, I enjoyed reflecting on that. Now, 
we got to make sure we cleanse it out. This leaven, our Lord's like, be on guard. Watch out for that leaven, because if a little bit gets in there, okay, um, it's going to mess up the whole batch, all right? A little bit of heresy mixed in with orthodox teaching, okay, can really mess things up for y'all. As Aquinas here, uh, in speaking about this, quotes the prop, the quotes the philosopher Aristotle, a small mistake in the beginning becomes a big mistake in the end. So our Lord's like, you got to watch out for this. It's going to come back again after I'm gone. He knows that, that the church is going to have to battle this leaven. This teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees is going to stick around uh, after he's gone and the church is going to have to deal with it. A small mistake at the beginning becomes a big mistake at the end. It might not seem like a big deal now, but I'm telling you, as the thing goes along, uh, it's going to get wider and wider, that uh, gap between these two teachings. Now, they are in Caesarea Philippi when our Lord has this incredible encounter with Peter and the apostles and poses this question to them. The placement of this is only found in Matthew that they are in Caesarea Philippi. All right, let's get our bearing. Caesarea Philippi, named after Caesar Tiberius, a city built by, you guessed it, Philip, one of the sons of Herod the Great. And uh, there's two videos that I'm going to post at the end of this teaching uh, that <clears throat> that I did in Caesarea Philippi, where you get a nice look, see, over the whole thing, uh, the whole place. Uh, and I really enjoyed my time. I spent two days at Caesarea Philippi uh, making these videos and walking around. And it was a very profound reflection for me. So I hope you get a chance to see those. But Caesarea Philippi is not to be confused with Caesarea Maritima. There's another city built by his father, Herod the Great, built this city out of nothing. Uh, this artificial harbor he constructed is uh, one of the wonders of the ancient world, uh, sinking these giant barges of concrete. It's fascinating. They still exist to this day, a remnant of this, this artificial harbor, man-made. And this city was hugely important uh, for Christianity. And I made a video about that as well in my Holy Land series. Um, but uh, these are two different locations, both called Caesarea. Of course, Caesar Augustus was Herod the Great's kind of patron. Uh, so he uh, wants to honor his patron by naming the city after him. And he has a great big temple constructed right at the entrance to the harbor front and center. Uh, and Philip does the same thing. Uh, at this location um, of Caesarea Philippi, there's this giant rock cliff that is really fascinating, and it became a site of pagan worship. So there were many different gods that they carved niches in this wall, and they constructed various temples uh, to these various gods. And he constructed one there, Philip did, uh, a temple to honor and worship Caesar Tiberius, all right, um, <clears throat> currying favor with the Romans. All right, now, uh, but ultimately, the primary god of this place, Caesarea Philippi, that was worshipped there, is the god Pan. Pan is the guy who's got the upper torso of a man and the lower <clears throat> torso of of a goat. He's got goat horns and he plays a flute, seduces young women, and he's this god of fertility and other things. This rustic country god. Pan means everything. Okay, so he's in some ways a summary of, of pagan worship uh, in general, uh, this god Pan, but he's a false suitor, a false suitor of the human race. That our Lord goes to this particular place this ancient city of Panias. And right at this location where there's this giant rock where all these pagan gods are worshipped, he declares himself, ultimately he's standing there as the true bridegroom of the human race and rejecting all these false suitors. Uh, so that's powerful to me when I was there. It feels almost romantic. Our Lord is defending his bride 
the honor of his bride, which is, in fact, the human race. So fascinating, fascinating location that our Lord chose. Um, it's a place of decision. It's a place of decision because he's going to ask this question, who, who do you say that I am? Peter's going to give his answer. And our Lord's going to go to the Mount of Transfiguration right after this. We'll see in chapter 17. Then he begins his march to Jerusalem. So this is a pivotal moment, a crux moment here. Our Lord um, preparing his disciples for what is coming down range. Now, let's talk about Peter's confession. This is huge. When he says, who do the people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter gives his answer. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. All right. We got to spend a lot of time pressing into that. We're going to go into the Old Testament in depth. because I really think it's worthwhile. Uh, because this is an incredibly important moment. All three synoptics have this profession of faith, this confession of St. Peter's found in all three synoptics. Uh, and also in John, in another sense, in another context, that uh, during the Bread of Life discourse, uh, when our Lord says, will you also leave me too? Because people were murmuring and walking away, and Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So it's it's there in John in a parallel fashion. Now, uh, Peter's confession. Uh, the Son of God, when he calls him the Son of the living God, look, we've got to realize the Son of God is not always, when that term is used, that expression does not necessarily imply somebody's divine. Okay, um, The Catechism makes it pretty explicitly clear. Paragraph 441 um, tells us that in the Old Testament, Son of God is a title given to the angels the chosen people, the children of Israel, and their kings. Okay? Um, it signifies an adoptive sonship that establishes a relationship of particular intimacy between God and his creature. When the promised Messiah king is called son of God, it does not necessarily imply that he was more than human, according to the literal meaning of these texts. Those who called Jesus Son of God as the Messiah of Israel perhaps meant nothing more than this. I mean, you have instances of, in John chapter 1, St. John the Baptist calls our Lord the Son of God. Now, in my reading of that, I think he does know that he is the divine Son of God, but it's debatable because he seems to have moments of doubt later on. Uh, Nathaniel, at the end of chapter 1, says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Okay. Um, does he necessarily mean that he is the son of God, capital S? Uh, when the apostles were in the boat back in chapter 14, when our Lord climbed into the boat after he, they saw him walking on the water, and Peter was trying to walk on the water, when they get back in the boat, uh, they get down and worship him, and they say, truly, you are the son of God. Now, Maybe the lights are starting to come on with the apostles, but I would say not quite yet. Uh, is he adopted, small s, son of God, or is he the son of God, capital S, the son of God by nature, equal to the father, equal, consubstantial, equal to the father? Okay, that is a absolute... Uh, nuclear explosion okay that is a plutonium bomb theologically uh to go from small s son to capital s son you gotta feel that when you're reading this um that for peter to say this and what i'm going to argue is because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to him but something that was revealed by the father to peter that I think he is really saying that you are the capital S 
son of God, that you are God. Okay, That's an astounding thing. Because it's not what necessarily the Jews believed about the Messiah. I mean, it says in 2 Samuel 7, when Nathan prophesied to David, you know, it says there, God says there that he shall be a son to me and I will be a father to him. This Messiah, this son of David who's going to come. Um, and he's referred to as a son of God and later in other Psalms, Messianic Psalms, like Psalm 89, for instance. Um, but again, I don't think the Jews had any, they had no notion of a capital S son of God. Okay, they were just simply thinking of it in the adopted sense, son of God. All right, so what is, who is our Lord? Well, Solomon, Solomon was the son of God in the small s sense. And uh, he was a son of David. But our Lord says something greater than Solomon is here. He's the actual constructor of the temple, Solomon, sure. But our Lord is says, I am, you have something greater than the temple here. He's greater than Solomon. All right. Now, <clears throat> did the devil know who Jesus was? That he had this uh, divine nature? Uh, that's questionable. I mean, he says in the temptation repeatedly, if you are the son of God, implies he's not really sure. He's testing him. Uh, if it was a fact uh, he wouldn't put it in that way. Uh, but, you know, in Mark 3.11, our Lord's casting out demons and they're leaving these people crying out, you are the son of God. But does the devil understand Jesus' true identity, his divine nature? Uh, it's highly doubtful. Um, but maybe, I don't know. Uh, it's difficult to look at a man and see God, okay? Okay. Uh, makes it all the more fascinating that Peter makes this confession because he's saying what's on the mind of all the apostles you know as they're contemplating the identity of their teacher of their rabbi of their master okay that they've left everything to follow who is he what is his identity imagine our Lord takes a lot of time and goes off to quiet places to pray there's lots of times doing errands going into towns and villages to get food and whatever, to do errands, okay, that they're walking and talking and sitting around the campfire. You see that in that uh, TV series, The Chosen, okay? Uh, you get to kind of sample what the dialogue might be like amongst the apostles. Well, certainly, they were trying to understand our Lord's identity. Um, this is <laughs> tricky to look at somebody and say they're God. Somebody looks just like the rest of us, like that burning bush. I mean, this proclamation, this apocalypse is what it is. Uh, when he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my heavenly father, okay? Revealed, what is that word? Apocalypto, okay? Where we get the word apocalypse. It literally means uh, uncovering something that was hidden. Something is being revealed, uncovered uh, to Peter. When he says this, um, this proclamation of our Lord's divinity. And our Lord knows it's hard to look at a man and say, that's, that's God. That's God. Uh, really tricky. Uh, as I'm reading this book, a rabbi talks to Jesus. That's what he comes back to repeatedly. This guy who's a Jew, current modern day Jew. And he writes this book of why he would not be a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. And what he comes back to again and again is who is Jesus? The eye of Jesus. Okay, He would have to be God for him to say and do the things that he does. All right, And at least he's honest enough to face that question. He just says, look, I do not believe he was God. And he writes a book to explain why that is. Um, about two-thirds of the way done. I'll let you know later. I'll give you a summary of it, but um, look, our Lord back in chapter 12, remember, he said, whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. I kind of like to think that our Lord is making a concession there to our weakness, our weak nature. We can't see. We only see appearances. We can't look into the heart. Uh, we're very 
dim with them bulbs, them bulbs. And yeah, our Lord, you know, says blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. It's an eternal sin. But anyone who says or speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. To me, that's an act of mercy, uh, that this is a test. We are the ones being tested. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are being tested right here. Um, look, the apostles, what have they been experiencing? Let's summarize some of these things, okay? Teaching with authority. They see our Lord saying, you have heard that it was said to you by the ancients, but I say to you, implying his authority supersedes Moses himself. Okay, he's taking on, the people were amazed, struck out of their senses by our Lord's authority, his bearing. He forgives sins. He's commanding the forces of nature, the winds and the waves, be still, be quiet. He's commanding demons, commanding illness. He even has command over death when he raises Jairus' daughter. Something greater than the temple, than the Sabbath, than Solomon, and Jonah is here. Who is this guy? It's got to be what the apostles are beginning to ask themselves and each other more and more and more. Um, they see him walking on water, and then he says, I am. Take heart, do not be afraid. I am. The very name of God, Ego Ami. Uh Unbelievable. Let's go read from paragraph 442 of the Catechism, right after the previous one I read, talking about the Son of God. is isn't necessarily something divine, but listen to this. Such is not the case for Simon Peter when he confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. For Jesus responds solemnly, flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. All right. So the catechism makes it explicitly clear that what Peter is saying is an apocalypse. Okay, It is a plutonium bomb um, going off here. Uh, eventually they're going to get this. Eventually they're going to get this and they're going to go to their own death getting this and proclaiming this. All right. And people who have a hard time accepting it are going to have to, after the resurrection, get this. Like Thomas, uh, when he puts his hand in our Lord's side and his fingers in his wounds and he says, my Lord and my God. He says that to a man, okay? But that's what it took to get him to that place where he could say those words. Uh, th th that's just so staggering to call somebody God. Um, <clears throat> now, let's remind ourselves that eventually, why is our Lord put to death for blasphemy, okay? Uh, Matthew 26, it's going to be the very same words of this response or answer that Peter gives here is the very thing our Lord's uh, the uh, high priest is going to say to our Lord in Matthew 26 63 and 64 I adjure you by the living God tell us if you are the Christ the son of God uh, such similar language that we're supposed to notice I'm sure and our Lord's response you have said so answers in the affirmative and then speaks of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, seated at the right hand of power on high. Um, the Jews, they knew this, they knew this, and they just rejected it. John chapter 5, verse 18. This was why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his Father, making himself equal with God. Okay, so that's out in the open um, in John's gospel, especially. So what I want to do now is I want to take some time. I want to take some time to delve into the Old Testament and see if our Lord's identity becomes more clear. Because now that we have this New Testament lens, okay, the veil has been removed from our mind and we can see Christ in the Old Testament. Um, come off the pages. Uh, this is the way the early church read these texts, and we should do likewise. 
All right. So I'm going to sample some of these important texts where we see that our Lord was active and had a incredibly strong leadership role and active agency in the Old Testament. There are many things we call manifestations or theophanies of the second person of the Blessed Trinity in the Old Testament. These are texts that along with all these astounding words and deeds of our Lord, the apostles must be combing, sifting through the Old Testament. And I wonder if these were under discussion, some of these things, as they entertain the idea that perhaps their teacher was God himself, possessed the divine nature. Were they beginning, was this beginning to get into this idea, hatch in the, in the mind of Peter, who finally had the courage to put it out in the open? Maybe. So their experience of our Lord's words and deeds and then the testimony of the scriptures themselves, I think, paved the way for this apocalypse, uh, apocalyptic moment of Peter's confession. So let's go through, starting with Genesis 22. Got to take a look at that in divine choreography. Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac going up Mount Moriah the very location where the temple and where Calvary will be. According to 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1, Solomon began to build the temple on Mount Moriah. So that's exactly the very location that God instructs Abraham to take his only beloved son. So he places the wood of the sacrifice on his son's shoulders, and they ascend this mountain together, where he's going to offer him as a sacrifice. And who stops his hand? The angel of the Lord, the Malik Yahweh. When you hear angel, angel is a title. Uh, the, the word angel here, as we find elsewhere, there's references to angels, and they are clearly simply created beings, spiritual beings that God created. that appear all throughout the Old and New Testament. But there's this mysterious angel of the Lord or angel of God that appears, that oftentimes is treated like God himself. And he seems to be separate from the Lord God, the, the Father, okay? There's a separate being that we see working and uh, who's different. There's a, a plurality uh, that's in a very mysterious way can be seen in the Old Testament it's the angel of the Lord, the Malik Yahweh. Angel just means a messenger, okay? This messenger of the Lord uh, stays the hand of um, Abraham. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about Jacob's ladder in chapter 28 of Genesis. Uh, who is this, um, what is this mysterious experience he has where he sees a ladder? He has this dream at Bethel. And there's this ladder that's planted on the ground, but its top is in the heavens, and the angels of God are ascending and descending on it. Okay, it's the mission of the Son. Okay, the Son of God, capital S. The incarnation is what's being revealed here to us, and our Lord says that very thing basically. When he talks to Nathaniel at the end of chapter one of John's Gospel, he says, You will see greater things than these because I saw you under the fig tree stick around okay you will see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man he's alluding to Jacob's ladder he's basically disclosing uh, this identity that he is he has come from above okay and he spans or mediates between heaven and earth um, so Jacob's ladder is fascinating and then later in chapter 32 uh, what's going to happen? Well, he's going to wrestle with a man all night, uh, Jacob. And it's, who is this man that he's wrestling with? I submit to you that it is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, that it is the Son of God, capital S, that he's wrestling with. Uh, why do I say that? Well, he refuses to give him his name. He changes Jacob's name to Israel in this episode changes his name and then when Jacob turns 
and asks him what his name is, this man he's been wrestling with all night. He says, why do you ask my name? A refusal to give a name is a theme that we'll see again. Okay, but that's fascinating because angels like Gabriel or Raphael or Michael, you know, we see them named. Um, this character, this mysterious angel of the Lord, refuses to be named. Okay, um, we'll come back to that. But look, after he has this encounter and the man leaves him, after wrestling all night, he says, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Um, he says he's seen God. Who is this man? Next, uh, the Malik Yahweh. Let's consider, let's continue talking about the Malik Yahweh, this angel of the Lord. Uh, who is it that speaks out of that burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 to Moses? The Malak Yahweh is the one speaking out of that bush who reveals his name. But it's a name, yeah, but the Catechism says it's also a refusal of a name, similar to that case with uh, Jacob wrestling the man all night. Yeah, he gives a name when Moses says, who shall I say sent me when, you, when I go to Pharaoh? He says, tell him I am sent you. I am who am. Okay, Ego Amy. Um, what is that? That's a name? It's a very mysterious name to just say, I am, that's your name. Okay, no one can really say that except the one who is. I mean, who can, how can you name somebody with that name? There's only one person, God himself, three persons, that can be called I am. All right, um, who is speaking here? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Okay, but then Moses is afraid to look at God and Moses speaks to God. The rest of the passage, he's clearly relating to God himself. Uh, this angel of the Lord is a manifestation or theophany of God himself. And I'm going to argue it's the messenger. It's the mission of the son in salvation history, the second person of the blessed Trinity there in Exodus chapter 3. Let's look at another instance. Flip ahead to Judges. And in Judges, we have two mysterious encounters. The first is Gideon. Gideon, one of the judges of Israel, okay, one of the saviors of Israel, uh, has an encounter with the angel of the Lord as he sat under this oak tree at Ophrah. And the angel of the Lord um, sends him says, I will be with you. Um, then he later, the angel of God, the angel of the Lord, uh, Gideon perceives that he was the angel of the Lord and says, alas, O Lord, uh, this is verse 22, alas, O Lord, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace to you, do not fear, <coughs> you shall not, <coughs> you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. Um, so very interesting here, this encounter of the angel of the Lord by Gideon. But even more interesting is in chapter 13 of Judges, you have the parents of Samson, the famous Samson, the Nazarite with the long hair who killed all the Philistines. Okay, <coughs> His father's name is Manoah. And his wife's not named, but she's a big part of this whole story. Go and read these two chapters and contemplate. This is our Lord here, the Son of God, uh, who appears as this angel of the Lord. Tells her that she's going to have a son, even though she's been barren, and uh, gives instruction about this. She goes and tells her husband, a man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of of the angel of God. Very terrible. I did not ask him whence he was, and he did not he did not tell me his name. So interesting. So this man of God, then again referred to as an angel of God or the man. Finally, uh, Manoah encounters him himself. And he says in verse 11, are you the man who spoke to this woman? He says, I am. 
Then look down. Uh, they ask him, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? What a mysterious thing to say. Who is this Malach Yahweh, this angel of God or angel of the Lord? Okay, who seems like a man of God. Okay, uh, <clears throat> in these theophanies. Uh, they are so blown away by this, they make a burnt offering and the angel of the Lord ascends in the column of smoke up into heaven. And they fall to their faces to the ground and they say, we shall surely die for we have seen God. Why are they saying that? Because in Exodus chapter 23, uh, 33, God, when uh, Moses wanted to see the face of God, God said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. That's uh, Exodus 33, 20. So people know we can't see God or we'll die. All right. Uh, and listen to this. We shall surely die for we have seen God. Okay. Judges 13. T. Now, uh, let's talk about, skip that one. Um, let's talk about the commander of the Lord. Let's flip back to Joshua. Chapter 5 of Joshua. There's this random encounter with this commander of the army of the Lord. Go back and read it. Verses 13 to the end. Um, Joshua was by Jericho. They hadn't sacked the city yet destroyed the city yet. Um, they had crossed, the people of Israel had crossed the Jordan River. And when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. Did the angel stop him? Did this mysterious commander of the army of the Lord stop him when he fell on his face and started worshipping him? Like the angel does in the book of Revelation when John falls down and starts worshipping this angel. And the angel's like, don't worship me, worship God. You know, um, <clears throat> I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. And he said, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you. Worship God. Um, very end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Uh, so look, this mysterious commander of the army of the Lord doesn't stop him when he falls on his face and worships him and says to him, what does my Lord bid his servant? Joshua says to him. And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, put, on your sh put off your shoes from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. This is a mysterious encounter that's very similar to the one of Moses when he encountered that burning bush and, and heard that same message. Remove your sandals. The place where you stand is holy ground. All right. So uh, Joshua has a similar encounter with this guy that I submit to you is the Son of God, capital S, a manifestation or theophany of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Now we can look at Daniel. The prophet Daniel has a whole bunch of interesting things. Number one in chapter two, you have this mysterious stone cut not by any human hand. All right. What is up with this stone? A stone was cut by no human hand, and it topples this statue, which is symbolic of these four nations or four empires <coughs> that come crashing down when they're struck by this stone, not cut by any human hand. Makes you think of the virgin birth, our Lord's miraculous conception and birth as man from above. The, the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay. If this isn't the son of God, the stone, okay, uh, rejected by the builders, what is? Um, so look, let's look at, uh, flip the page and look at chapter three. And you got these three men, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
uh, who were thrown into the fire by Nebuchadnezzar. And when they look in there, <coughs> they see that they're not hurt. They're loose and walking around, seem to be unhurt. And there's a fourth man in there. The appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Who is this mysterious personage in the fiery flames with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That's what I submit to you. Now we'll flip over to chapter 7 and we'll hear about this. One like a son of man. Notice the qualifier. One like a son of man. Okay. Uh, very important. Uh, who receives all authority and power. Um, obviously, very mysterious identity of uh, this character is also found in chapter 10. In chapter 10 of Daniel, he has another encounter with this man clothed in linen. Who is this guy? Daniel alone saw the vision. The men who were with him did not see the vision Reminds you of Paul on the road to Damascus. He sees the vision, but the men who were with him did not. Okay, uh, He encounters this man clothed in linen. And his, the description of him is very much like what we hear in the book of Revelation. His body was like barrel. His face was like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. And the sound of his words like the noise of a multitude. Um, who is it? Son of God, I submit to you. Now, are we done yet? Nope. We can look at Isaiah. Uh, we've already mentioned the Immaculate Conception in 714. This virgin birth, this sign that God's going to give Ahaz. So I myself will give you a sign. Look, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Put all these things together. I'm telling you. Uh, you start to see the picture come into focus. You look at chapter 9 and you hear about this, more about this child um, who's going to be a great light to Galilee of the nations. And who in verse 6 it says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And notice what it says. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All right. <coughs> Who, what is the identity of this mysterious child, son that is born to us? Um Moving on in Isaiah, we got to look at 52.10. Now let's skip 52.10. Let's look at 53.8. This is the fourth and final suffering servant song, the grand finale. Uh, this is the greatest, the one we're the most familiar with, how he's going to carry our griefs and sorrows and make um, bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. All this. Uh, the end of chapter 52 and through to the end of chapter 53 is this famous fourth and final suffering servant song that the Ethiopian prophet was reading in his chariot, remember, back in Acts chapter 8, and it was Philip who was sent to him by the Spirit who helped him understand what he was reading, all right? So this is a very important passage quoted all over the place in the New Testament, and what does it say there in verse 8? It says that his generation, who considered, as for his generation, who considered it? Who knew his generation? There's something mysterious here about the suffering servant. Well, <clears throat> I think it's the very same individual that we heard about back in chapter 7. It's this Emmanuel, this child born of a virgin, who is going to be mighty God and everlasting father. Uh, you have to connect that in Isaiah with this later suffering servant song. It's all talking about the ministry or mission of this Messiah. His, his birth is going to be mysterious. <coughs> we see that in Micah. Let's look at the prophet Micah for a second. And in chapter 5, verse 2, very important text, 2 and 3. Uh, you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me 
one is to who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Makes you think of St. John the Baptist. You know, he's like, look, I myself did not know him. Okay, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. And we know John the Baptist was conceived prior to our Lord's conception. But yet John the Baptist is saying, this man ranks before me, for he was before me. His origin is from of old, from ancient of days. Um, so Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Let's look back at Proverbs. This is so interesting here. Uh, listen to what God says. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Very mysterious passage here. Who has a... <laughs> Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Very interesting because this is clearly talking about God. And seems to imply that I mean, does more than imply uh, that God has a son. Uh, another mysterious passage. So, look, um, yeah, he's going to be a, a son of God. God is going to call him father. Or, excuse me, he's going to call God his father, and God's going to call him his son. We heard back in 2 Samuel 7 the origin of this whole messianic expectation that original prophecy of Nathan to David in 2 Samuel 7. And the Jews interpreted that as a small s, adopted son. But our Lord's going to argue in the Gospels with Psalm 110, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, that begins this way. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Now, this is a psalm of David. It's David who is speaking in this psalm. That's clear to everybody. It's a messianic psalm. <coughs> Sorry, I've been sick and I'm just getting over it. Uh, <clears throat> but look, if this is just an adopted son of God, okay, in the small s sense, okay, um, why would David call him Lord? That's our Lord's point to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Okay, he's going to say, look, if he's just a son of David, and that's it, human origin, human alone, just a man of this world, alone, that's it. Why would David call him Lord? Because clearly this is a psalm talking about the Messiah. And David says, the Lord God said to my Lord, and then the rest of the psalm is addressed to this Messiah, description of this Messiah who's going to be seated at the right hand of God. God's going to put him at his right hand. What human being is going to be placed at the right hand of God? I got to get a cough drop. If this doesn't help, I might have to do this after I recover. My voice recovers a little bit, but let me see if I can keep going here. Um, <clears throat> All right, now, I want to talk next a little bit about the Trinity. Because we've talked about Christ. But let's just broaden this a little bit. The Trinity itself is found in a hidden way in the Old Testament, revealed in the Old Testament. First, we want to look at these plural, this plural pronoun, use of plural pronouns, us and we that we see. Now I gotta blow my nose, hang on. All right, Genesis chapter one. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Verse 26, chapter one, verse 26. Uh, this mysterious we language, us, is very interesting from a Christian point of view. We see the Trinity here. Yeah, it could be at the, um, um, Majest, you know, the the we of majesty, like 
we are not amused, you know. <clears throat> uh, or he could be speaking to his heavenly court or whatever. But I think it's clear with the New Testament lens uh, that who is speaking here, all three persons of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, they're going to say this again. When uh, man sins, <clears throat> he drove the man out. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Very interesting. Also, you can flip to chapter 11. The Tower of Babel incident. They go down. God goes down to investigate here. And let us go down in verse 7. Chapter 11, verse 7. Come, let us go down there and confuse their speech. Let us. Um, these are very mysterious and worth mentioning. And Isaiah, also chapter 6, when he has his mystical experience and he's transported to the throne room of God. And the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. A trihagion. Uh, they say, interestingly, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? What is that us? Now, um, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch is interesting to me in Genesis 15. I think it holds the key of salvation history. I think it's incredibly important and should be talked about more. This whole incident in chapter 15, this mystical trance that Abraham is put under and this smoking fire pot and flaming torch go through the animal parts. What's up with that? Okay, he cut up these animal parts and then he was put into a trance. It's like covenant making uh, procedure here. Uh, they go through these animal parts. The two parties that are making a covenant are to walk through the animal parts. Basically, they're, they're bringing a curse on themselves. If they are not faithful to this covenant, may this happen to them. Okay, like a child who says, <clears throat> I promise, I promise, I swear, stick a needle in my eye. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. You know, there's an invocation of a curse here. You're entering into an agreement, and it's uh, very serious. Uh, when you walk through animal parts, well, God takes up both parts of the covenant himself. But the smoking fire pot and flaming torch to me are the missions of the Son and the Spirit. The two hands of the Father, the Catechism says in multiple places. <clears throat> it's an analogy. Every analogy limps. But God is tripartite, okay, triune. And uh, he seems clear from looking at the Old Testament and the New Testament that the missions of the Son and the Spirit, these are his two hands that he accomplishes salvation history with. That's what I see in Genesis <clears throat> chapter 15. Now, these three men in Genesis, this is absolutely amazing. In chapter 18 and 19, go back and read these and think of the Trinity here. This is, you see iconography in the East portraying this. Uh, these three men are these three angelic beings, uh, but they are God. Let's make no bones about it. Uh, the Lord appeared to Moses by the oaks of Mamre, and he lifted up his eyes and behold, Three men stood in front of him. Very mysterious. And they speak as one. That's so interesting. They said, you know, <clears throat> and so on. In verse, verse 5, verse 9, they said to him, <clears throat> where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. And then the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, okay? All caps means Yahweh. Is speaking and in this story the Lord is the father okay the Lord said I will surely return to you in the spring and Sarah your wife shall have a son <clears throat> and uh, anyway uh, looking down further and the Lord returns the celestial heavenly father and who continues on to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroys them, but these two angels or two men. So it's like the Lord went his way, the Father, 
And then who continues on to Sodom and Gomorrah, but the other two angels uh, split off the two missions of the Son and the Spirit. Um, the Lord has sent us, they say in verse 13. Um, and they're referred to as men, angels. It's mysterious. Who are these characters, okay? This is the Trinity at work in chapter 18 and 19. Read it <clears throat> with the Trinity in mind, and you'll see what I'm saying. Now, uh, Isaiah 48, 16. This is an amazing passage in Isaiah. Oh, my goodness. This is the Son of God talking, okay? This is the Son of God talking. Chapter 48, verse 16. Go read it in your Bible. Underline it. Listen to this. Draw near to me. Hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. There is a clear reference to the Trinity if you have a Christian lens <clears throat> to read this with. Um, now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. That's That one gives me chills almost. Of course, you also have the mission of the Son and the Spirit disclosed through this branch, okay? This branch that's going to spring forth from the stump of Jesse, this Messiah that is going to come, this fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7, after the tree was chopped down, uh, there's going to be a branch, a Netzer, the Nazarene, the Netzerine is going to spring forth. Jesus of Nazareth, Netzereth. Okay, a branch, a netzer shall grow out of his roots, out of this dead stump of Jesse, Jesse being the father of David. And what does it say, verse 2? And the spirit of the Lord shall rest, rest upon him. All right, um, just like it did at the baptism of the Lord. It came upon him. Um, in chapter 61 of Isaiah, the very passage our Lord read in the synagogue at Nazareth begins this way. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted and so on. So we see here mysteriously in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and then in chapter 61, verse 1, okay, this Messiah, this branch, the Spirit of God is going to rest upon him. Okay, the missions of the Son and the Spirit in the Old Testament, enough about that. All of this is much more explicit in John. You know, no one has ever seen God, he says in the prologue. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. Okay, kolpos, this word, is, it connotes intimacy. Kolpos, the inner folds of a garment. In the, it's translated bosom. But in, he has intimacy with the Father. I and the Father are one, he's going to say in chapter 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. He shares this intimacy. He can reveal the Father to us. Because he's the only one who knows the Father in this intimate sense of uh, being in his bosom. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, he's going to say in chapter 14, verse 6. Chapter 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am, okay? Chapter 17, verse 5, glorify me, says to his father, glorify thou me with the glory which I share with thee before the foundation of the world. The Son of God, capital S, is who Jesus is, <coughs> existed before Abraham. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, John 3, 16, we're all familiar with. I am ascending to my father and your father. Notice the distinction there. My father and your father. Yeah, it's your father by adoption. It's my father by nature. <coughs> I gotta get another cough drop going here. Lastly, we have beheld his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. All right. 
When we have deeply reflected, as we have done here, on Jesus' divine identity, and just place yourselves in, uh, put yourself in the place of these apostles and Peter, they've been reflecting, they've been considering, they've been sifting through the Old Testament. They've been watching our Lord perform mighty signs and deeds and wonders that defy um, a human being, his capacity, okay? Um, doing things that only God does, forgiving sins, walking the water, commanding forces of nature, the devil, death, everything. Uh, unbelievable. They're starting to put things together. And finally, Peter comes out and says this. And what happens? The Christmas tree lights up. The Catholic faith will come alive when you come into our church here at St. Mary the Mills. And you see that very image at the entrance, that ginormous picture of Jesus with all this in your mind. You see the man from heaven. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. He is an alien. Not a green man with antennae coming out of his head. He is completely otherworldly. A transcendent God. He came down into this world from outside of it. He is transcendent. He does not belong to this cosmos. You are of this cosmos. I am not of this cosmos. John 8, 23. Now, um, when we get this, when we have this apocalypse about Jesus' identity, this is the question for us and for the whole human race. When we get it, the whole Catholic faith comes alive. The whole practice of our faith comes alive. It's like turning on the Christmas tree. All the power flowing through the sacraments now. We get it. Everything else is much easier to believe. That our Lord could be present in that Eucharist under the forms of bread and wine? Easy. Once we get this, that we're going to live forever? Easy. Once we know who this is, and we take him at his word. <clears throat> it's so momentous. The, the, the fact that God walked around down here. Not just a great moral teacher charismatic religious leader some great prophet or something but God himself got to get that and come back to it again over and over in a fresh way we got to get this into our peanut brain every day I'm trying to go deeper press deeper into the mystery of Jesus's identity that he is the capital S son of God and his coming into this world as the center of human history should be the front line or should be the, the front page headline of our hearts and minds every day. The whole landscape, everything is different because God walked around down here and everything he said and did is of extreme importance, even if everybody else in the world ignores it or isn't paying attention, thinks it's old news 2,000 years ago. It doesn't matter that it was 2,000 years ago. It doesn't matter a bit thousand years or as a day to the almighty it's it's nothing everything's different now this whole world is different it's changed <clears throat> for us who see this the veil has been lifted that i mentioned before so i was really referring or alluding to first corinthians chapter three where excuse me second corinthians chapter three where saint paul he says this very thing since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not see the end of the fading splendor. You know, when he went into the tabernacle to talk to the Lord face to face and his face was radiant, and they didn't want to look at his face. They didn't want to see the end of the fading splendor, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, <clears throat> when they read the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. <clears throat> but when a man turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So turning to the Lord, just another way of saying, 
<clears throat> turning to him and saying, you are the Lord, my Lord and my God. You are the Christ, the Son, capital S, of the living God. We have to say that with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength if we're going to get our Catholic faith. Um, I think we did some justice to this. Now I want to move on. And we're going to get... <clears throat> now will be a good time to take a break if you're going to take a break. Um, next, I want to talk about Peter. Okay? Um, let's start <clears throat> by just reading again verse 17 through 19. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we have three verses and three statements, each of which contain three separate phrases or clauses, okay, that have their own affirmations, okay? So it's like nine total things. Uh, but each of these verses is like a positive <clears throat> statement, <clears throat> affirmation addressed to Peter, okay, addressed to Peter. The problem is going to be, and this is such a profound statement that we only find in Matthew's gospel, that those who are not of Catholic persuasion are going to do everything they can to get out of this problem that our Lord seems to be calling a man rock and then saying he's going to give him keys and he's going to build his church on him. Okay, this is central to the Catholic faith and understanding of the Catholic faith. So, of course, if you want to reject the Catholic church, the Catholic faith, you're going to do everything you can to try to figure out <clears throat> a different interpretation for this, that this rock, you are Peter, and upon this rock, what is that rock that he's going to build his church on? What is that rock? Is it Peter? That's what we believe as Catholics. Is it Christ? Is it Peter's confession? Okay, what is the rock, or who is the rock? Those are the three things we're going to look at, and let's start with Christ. Um, well, let's start with this point, a couple preliminary points. <clears throat> First of all, this is an unprecedented name. You don't find this name anywhere in the Old Testament. In Hebrew literature, you don't find it anywhere. <clears throat> a human being called Rock. <clears throat> Simply not found. God is the Rock of Israel. I counted 39 times in the Old Testament God is referred to as a rock. There's three different Hebrew words, a ben, selah, and tesor. Okay? Um, yeah, you have Petra used. It's very interesting. In the Septuagint translation, the Greek translation, uh, for whatever reason, they, even though it's very explicit in the Hebrew that um, God is referred to as a rock, there's a hesitancy Amongst the translators, translating into Greek, they simply ignore it. Most of these references of God as rock. What were they worried? Maybe worried about pagan influence, a pagan misunderstanding, misinterpretation of that, and interpreting it in some kind of pagan sense? I don't know. But I just found that frustrating in a certain sense because I was looking. But I did find the word Petra used in Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, this rock that Moses strikes twice. Uh, the word there is Petra, okay? Uh, and interestingly, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, he's going to say that rock that Moses struck was Christ. And he uses the very same word, Petra, all right? Um so is Christ the Petra? Um, it seems very strange and does violence, first of all, to the whole structure, this threefold structure. When you read through verse 17 and 19, what 
many Protestants will say is that because there's two different words here, when Jesus says, You're, you are Peter, the word in Greek is Petros, which they're going to try to say means little rock. And why does Jesus switch words or switch forms? Uh, well, we'll talk about that. Some theories why that would be. Why would he switch words from Petros, a masculine word, to Petra? Um, but it does violence to the text to think that in the middle of this threefold affirmation of Peter, I mean, that's the way you would naturally read this. At least I do. You know, he's saying positive things to Peter. Blessed. Blessed are you, Peter. Simon bar Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So affirmative statements. Affirming Peter. Blessing him. Then the Protestant reading of verse 18 is... For I tell you, you are Petros, you know, a little rock. And on this rock, big rock, I will build my church and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. But then, verse 19 is back to Peter again. The emphasis is clearly on Peter. <laughs> he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and what you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. See how disruptive that is? How forced that is? It does violence to the flow of this, these three verses. That sandwiched in the middle of it is a denial or negation. Uh, almost a, a reproof of Peter in the Protestant interpretation. You are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. It just seems very forced. <clears throat> now, um, first of all, Protestants will say that the reason Matthew is signaling here this their favorite interpretation is because Petros in Greek they'll argue means little rock or stone okay um, whereas Petra is like a stationary large rock okay <coughs> So they interpret that as saying, you're just a little rock, I'm the big rock. All right, but this is sketchy, folks. Sketchy, why? Because that distinction is only found in like ancient classical Greek, okay? In the Attican period of Greek literature, you find some poems where there's a distinction between these two words, but that's in the fourth and fifth century BC. By the time this is being written by Matthew, a Koine Greek, common Greek, okay, there is really no such distinction that can be found. Uh, it's not really clear. That's a very weak argument uh, to make. So, so then why does Matthew do it? Here's a couple possibilities. Why does he switch from a masculine word for Peter to a feminine word for rock? Okay, Petros to Petra. Why does he do that? Maybe because, first of all, he wasn't even speaking Greek when our Lord said this. He was speaking Aramaic, presumably. That's why Peter's name is Kephas. Okay, because there's only one word in Aramaic for rock. Okay, Kephas. And so when our Lord originally said this, he wouldn't have made this distinction between these two words. Matthew is doing this in relating this account to us. Uh, but in the original language, yes, but this is the inspired text, so we have to deal with this distinction between these two words, Petros and Petra. One common Catholic explanation is very simple. Like, you're not going to call this dude's name with a feminine noun, okay? You're not going to name him Petra, okay? Uh, Petrina, you know. Um, no, he is Peter. Petros is a masculine noun, so it's it's that could be why. Um, it is curious that he switched from Petros to Petra. But another possibility could be back in chapter seven, the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, verses twenty-four to twenty-seven. 
Everyone who builds their house, everyone who hears these words and does them is like the wise man who built his house upon the Petra, the rock. Okay, so perhaps Matthew is alluding back to the Sermon on the Mount here. And the wise builder builds his house upon the Petra. Maybe that's what he is evoking in the minds of his readers when he makes this switch. Uh, but those are two plausible answers. Um, but I think the Jimmy Aiken, uh, this great senior apologist on Catholic Answers for Catholic Answers, uh, he, this was instrumental, uh, this, this argument from the threefold structure of these words, verses 17 and 19, was instrumental in converting him from being a Protestant to becoming a Catholic, now the senior apologist at Catholic Answers. And it was this very uh, passage, these three verses, when he saw clearly the threefold structure, and you read through it with a Protestant uh, interpretation, and you see how violent it is, how disruptive it is to the flow and unity of these words of our Lord. Um, when you read it in the Catholic sense, it just flows much more naturally. And um, so, look, <clears throat> another great argument here. So our Lord's going to say, <coughs> you are Peter, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. So he's going to build on himself. Um, yeah, I mean, this metaphor of building is all over the place in the New Testament. Um, sometimes our Lord is the foundation, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Our Lord is the only foundation that we can build on. Uh, interestingly, there <clears throat> we are the builders. Paul and the apostles are the builders. And we build <clears throat> our lives are going to be judged on this foundation that we built on. Uh, the one foundation, chapter 10, according to chapter 3, verse 10 and following of 1 Corinthians, according to the commission of, commission of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and another man is building upon it. Let each man take care how he builds upon it. Each man, all of us, <clears throat> are building something, our lives. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, so in this instance, in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, our Lord is the foundation. But then elsewhere, the apostles and the prophets are also referred to as the foundation. Ephesians 2.20 Revelations 21, 14. All right, so <clears throat> you see a switch in the use of this metaphor. Uh, the household, so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Chapter 2, verse 20 of Ephesians, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So they're also a foundation. Revelation 21, 14, the 12 stones of the foundation of God's city are the apostles. <clears throat> now, yeah, I, uh, I just don't know what to make of all this. You know, uh, those there are some who want to argue, you know, in the strict sense that there's no way that this stone that he's going to build, notice, notice, his church. It's his church. My church. I will build my church um, <clears throat> on this foundation, on this Petra. Um, <clears throat> it's our Lord's church. Uh, and in this instance, yeah, he's the one building. But then in 1 Corinthians, he's the foundation and others are building. And in other instances, Peter, in this case in Matthew 16, in Ephesians 2.20 and in Revelation, you see that the apostles are the foundation. So you can't make a strong argument there and apply, you know, some sort of, um, if you only say, look, see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
Our Lord is the only foundation. It can't be Peter. Only our Lord is the foundation. What about Ephesians 2.20? What about the book of Revelation? Uh, <clears throat> Revelation 21.14. And other people are building in 1 Corinthians, not just our Lord. He's not, like he's building the church on Peter, he says in Matthew 16. But, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, others are building the apostles. And each of us are building, all right, the rock is Peter's confession of faith. It's another one you might hear sometimes from Protestants. We'll say, um, look, the rock was Peter's confession. That's the rock that our Lord's building the church on. That is um, a violent thing to say as well. It's a bad anthropology to rip away this guy's confession of faith from the person himself. I don't know how you get away. <clears throat> it's a deficient a deficient anthropology to do that, I would argue. Uh, it cannot separate the faith from the person, okay? So uh, there's no way around the fact with a modern literary critical analysis of the text, even great, and I mean these are first-class, world-class Protestant scholars of the 20th century and contemporary ones, three of whom here, I'm going to cite, have all admitted, along with Orthodox theologians too, that when you read Matthew 16, 17, and 19 together, when you use close critical literary analysis of the text, there's no way around the fact that Peter is the Petra that our Lord is building the church on. Peter himself, personally. We have to deal with that. <clears throat> and construct our arguments from that point forward, so to speak. Um, there's no way around it. Here are three Protestant scholars <coughs> who have drawn this conclusion. F.F. Bruce. Frederick Fivey. Bruce, 1910 to 1990, usually cited as F.F. Bruce, <clears throat> was a British biblical scholar who supported the historical reliability of the New Testament. His book, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable?, was voted by the American Evangelical Periodical Christianity Today, Christianity Today in 2006 as one of the top 50 books which has shaped evangelicals. <clears throat> but he also saw that Peter was the rock that Christ built the church on. D.A. Carson, Donald Arthur Carson, born in 1946, is Emeritus Professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, co-founder of the Gospel Coalition. He is a prominent evangelical scholar and author. Carson has been described as doing the most seminal New Testament work by contemporary evangelicals and as one of the last great Renaissance men in evangelical biblical scholarship. All this stuff I'm getting, I got off articles in Wikipedia about these guys. He has written on a wide range of topics, including New Testament hermeneutics, biblical theology, the Greek New Testament, the use of the Old Testament and the New and more. <clears throat> Another one, Carson says, the rock is Peter. Walter Elwell, an evangelical theological academic, he is most noted for his editorial output, numbering several evangelical standard reference works. <coughs> Amazing, I looked at all the stuff this guy wrote. <coughs> he taught at Wheaton College, Illinois, from 75 to 2003 before retirement and is now Professor Emeritus of Bible and Theology at Wheaton College. Another one. <clears throat> Finally came to admit Peter is the rock that our Lord is building the church on. All right, let's talk about Abraham and Peter here. This is interesting. Abraham and Peter have a lot in common that we ought to stop and take note of because, yeah, I did say no one has ever been named rock 
but Abraham is one of the only ones who was referred to as a rock. <coughs> we'll see. Let's go through this. <clears throat> Both of them are blessed. I mean, this is, don't take that for granted. That's an incredible thing that our Lord blesses Peter here. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Our Lord blesses Abraham in Genesis 14, 19. Both respond with heroic faith. <clears throat> Read Hebrews 11, 8 for an account of Abraham's faith. Both receive a divine mission are sent by God on a mission. Both have their names changed. <clears throat> Abraham's name is changed to Abraham in Genesis 17.5. Both are called rock. Now, I'm quoting for you Psalm 51. Look it up for yourself. Psalm, Psalm sorry. Isaiah 51, verse 2. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. And he, when he was but one, I called him. Hang on. Wrong verse. Hearken to verse 1. Chapter 51, verse 1. Hearken to me, you who pursue deliverance, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, <clears throat> and to the quarry from which you were digged. Look to Abraham, your father. Referred to as a rock. So interesting, isn't it? Our Lord's calling him Rock, Peter. Very interesting comparison between Abraham and Peter. And lastly, both are short of victory over the gates of their enemies. Is that not fascinating? Go back to Genesis 22. And after he stays Abraham's hand, he says these wonderful things, reiterating his worldwide blessing that will result your descendants shall all the nations bless themselves. But listen to what he says in verse 17. Your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. So um, is our Lord alluding to something here, connecting somehow Peter and his new role with Abraham himself, of whom the Pharisees, the Jews are so happy to be called children of Abraham. Remember John the Baptist, you know, kind of rebuked them for that. God could raise children of Abraham up out of these rocks. And our Lord's like, look, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Before Abraham was, I am. All right. <clears throat> our Lord's the one who called Abraham <coughs> and changed his name. And now he's changing this man's name. All right, now we got to look at Isaiah chapter 22 in the context of, um, bear with me, everybody. Hang in there. Got to look at Isaiah chapter 22. This is critical. Critical for contextualizing these words of our Lord. This encounter with Peter has to be understood with this backdrop of Isaiah chapter 22. Because you have this guy, Shebna, okay, who's a prime minister. He is over the house. This is an expression that is found in Genesis uh, chapter 40, referring to uh, Joseph, who was over the house of Pharaoh, placed over the house of Pharaoh, essentially the role of a prime minister. And kind of a, has a priestly connotation a little bit, too. Um, Shebna has been like, you know, driving around in fancy chariots and building himself a fancy, lavish tomb. And... Uh, Guess the guys were impressed with himself. Self-seeking, <clears throat> he gets kicked out. God kicks him out of his, I will thrust you out from your office and you will be cast down from your station. Okay. To me, this guy Shebna being kicked out is kind of like the Jewish Sanhedrin, the high priest and the whole system. Okay. It is being thrust out of their station or office and supplanted now uh, by a new leader, okay, who's going to be what? His name is Eliakim, and he's going to be clothed with your robe, and he's going to bind your girdle on him. <clears throat> and I, um, and will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Israel. 
of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. All right, look, whoever this guy is, Eliakim, this prime minister that God has thrust Shebna out and placed Eliakim in his place, given him his authority. And he's going to be a father. Notice that paternal relationship with the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. Okay, um, what do we call the Pope? Pope? Where does Pope come from? <clears throat> Papa just means father. This comes across much more clear in Spanish and Italian. They call him Papa. Okay, uh, we say Pope in English for whatever reason, and uh, but you don't necessarily get the connotation of fatherhood from Pope because it's kind of a unique word in English, and maybe we don't always think of a father. But that's exactly what the word Pope means. Okay, and this Eliakim shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And he will become a throne of honor. <coughs> very important, very important to see uh, that context for Matthew chapter 16. Uh, that our Lord has to be um, evoking. <clears throat> so Peter is given this authority to bind and loose. Uh, let's talk about, just as Eliakim um, binds, uh, sh shall open and none shall shut, shall shut and none shall open, binding and loosing. Uh, <clears throat> other key Petrine texts or points that need to be made to kind of do a mop-up operation on Peter here. Uh, let's pull this whole thing together now. Peter is named nearly 200 times in the New Testament. Almost 200 times. Way more than all the other apostles combined. The next closest is John. It's just under 40. So Peter factors in huge. The first half of the Acts of the Apostles could be referred to as the Acts of Peter. <clears throat> all right, um... Peter and the apostles. You hear references like in Acts 5.29 when they're being interrogated, interrogated by the high priest and the Sanhedrin. There's this reference to Peter and the apostles in 5.29 in the Acts. Um, yeah, there's other examples of that. Like the angel when the women encounter at the end of Mark's gospel, chapter 16, verse 7. You know, uh, <clears throat> go tell Peter. Uh, Tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. The words of the angel. Look how Peter is singled out. Um, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 15, the beginning of it, there is this formulaic creedal, this creedal formula of the resurrection gospel that Paul seems to be conveying. Uh, what I first received, I now hand on to you. It's kind of creedal formulaic expression here that Paul's using. And what does he say? He says that our Lord first appeared to Peter. Now, that's pretty amazing. That he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Um, and we see that in Mark's gospel too, um, don't we? Let me double check. I think in Mark's gospel, or maybe, <clears throat> uh, maybe it's John, uh, maybe it's Luke, I mean, um, I think it's Luke. Now I got to check. Uh, yeah, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Um, yeah, they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Amazing. It's like Simon has a certain authority. He's the one that stands up in Acts chapter 1 and takes the leadership role in selecting a successor to Judas who killed himself to fill that office. Okay. And they cast lots, which is a priestly thing to do. Kind of interesting. Uh, <clears throat> he's the one that delivers the first sermon at Pentecost. He's the one that speaks and addresses the people in Solomon's portico in chapter 3. 
And in chapter four, <coughs> he's the one that speaks. Um, you know, John's with him, but it's Peter really speaking <coughs> uh, to the Sanhedrin in chapter four. Uh, all over the place. I mean, he's the one that rose after all the debate in chapter 15 in the, in the uh, Council of Jerusalem uh, and speaks. And everybody's silent. <clears throat> hey, Peter rose. Peter, Peter, Peter. Um, he's uh, extremely important. Extremely important. <clears throat> now, this was signaled to us in Matthew Let's just note again that in chapter 10, when all the apostles are named, first Peter. Judas is always last, but first Peter. And the word there, first, protos, it's powerful. Uh, that Matthew sticks that little word in there <clears throat> very deliberately. <clears throat> first Peter. First Simon, who is called Peter. Now, Strengthening your brethren in Luke 22 is very important that our Lord specifically prays for Peter. Luke 22, verses 31 to 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you all, that he might sift you all like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned, strengthen your brethren. So there's a shift, you know, Satan has demanded to shift all of you. It's a you in Greek, you see, is plural. He's talking about all the apostles. Satan's demanded to sift all the apostles. <clears throat> but then it's a shift to the singular. Our Lord turns to Peter specifically and says, but I have prayed for you singularly, Peter. I have prayed for you. When you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. Okay, so again, here we see our Lord praying over Peter. And he has a special role to strengthen and encourage the hearts of the other apostles, a leadership role. Once again, we see that in John 21. After our Peter's threefold denial, <clears throat> our Lord's threefold uh, mission or instruction to feed my sheep or feed my lambs. Um, very interesting. Notice they're his lambs, though, just like it's his church. <coughs> we belong to the Lord. Um, is Peter perfect? Infallibility. We should talk about that just a little bit. Infallibility. What does that even mean? To be infallible is when Peter and the apostles in union with him, or even just Peter when he speaks ex cathedra from the chair. <clears throat> uh, you have a statement on faith and morals when it's pronounced authoritatively, officially. Yes. We believe in infallibility as Catholics, okay? <clears throat> what you declare bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, and so on. <clears throat> Does that mean that Peter is impeccable? By no means. In this very chapter, you know, he's going to be called Satan by our Lord in just a moment. You know, uh, his character defects are on full display all over the pages of the Gospels. <clears throat> So is Peter perfect? No, absolutely not. Is he impeccable? No. Even Paul rebukes him in Galatians. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. He was kind of duplicitous in Antioch. He, not eating with Gentiles, eating with these Jews and following these customs of the Judaizers of <clears throat> those who were... All right, hey, here's a great quote by G.K. Chesterton on this point of, of Peter's weakness. Could this be the guy that our Lord built the church on? Is this the rock? Well, listen to what a convert to the faith G.K. Chesterton says in his book, Heretics. When Christ, at a symbolic moment, was establishing his great society... He chose for its cornerstone neither the brilliant Paul nor the mystic John, but a shuffler, a snob, a coward, in a word, a man. And upon this rock he has built his church, and the gates of hell have not prevailed against it. All the empires and the kingdoms have failed because of this inherent and continual weakness that they were founded by strong men and upon strong men. But this one thing, the historic Christian church, 
was founded on a weak man. And for that reason, it is indestructible for no chain is stronger than its weakest link in this whole Petrine chain of succession all the way to the present day Pope Francis. <clears throat> um, hey, it's like our Lord went out of his way to demonstrate this. He chose the weakest guy. He said, I'm going to make him the first link in this chain. All right, so that you see, it's me who's making this, giving this chain its strength. Okay, and preserving this chain from being broken. Um, all right, a couple other little minor things here. Uh, Bar Jonah is something you could take notice of that Simon Bar Jonah is what our Lord calls Peter. And uh, in John 142, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42, uh, his, he's his father's name is is uh, Simon. Uh, excuse me, uh, John. <coughs> John. And so, why the discrepancy here? Simon, son of John, um, and Simon Bar Jonah. Well, a couple different possibilities according to Saint Thomas Aquinas. It could be a copyist error, or it could be that we believe, perhaps strong reasons to believe that <clears throat> testimony in ancient times in the early church that Matthew was originally written in Aramaic so this could be a Aramaic kind of <clears throat> transliteration of the word uh, John into Greek coming co coming through Aramaic <coughs> it could have come differently as Jonah um so it could be just a linguistic thing or a copyist error, not quite sure. But the fact that he refers to the sign of Jonah twice in Matthew's gospel, and in this very chapter he did that. And then curiously, <clears throat> Matthew is called Simon Bar Jonah. It just makes me scratch my head. Like it's something else going on here. Um, Jonah means dove. Okay, When I think of dove, Think of the whole story of Jonah, we've already talked about, but also Jonah's name. The guy who got thrown into the water and died. And his name means dove. Can't help but think of Noah. Kind of this Noah illusion in <clears throat> referring to him as Simon Bar, Jonah Bar, son of a dove. Son of the dove. Um, I don't know. Just speculating. Well, we do refer to the bark of Peter, don't we? The bark of Peter uh, is like a new Noah's Ark in a certain sense, the church. And that symbol of the Ark. <clears throat> um, all right, I'll just stop right there with that little personal reflection. But, but anyway, like... Aquinas says it could just be a copyist error or a linguistic discrepancy. Now, the word church, we should mention here, ecclesia in Greek, okay? We don't, the, the, the word we use in English, church, doesn't come from ecclesia, okay? It comes from, ultimately, kirk in German. It's traceable all the way back to Greek, <clears throat> kyriake, kyrios is lord. The things that belong to the Lord are called Kyriake. <clears throat> Kirk, church, it's a funny sounding word. But we are all called to belong to the Lord. <clears throat> As um, St. Paul says at the beginning of Romans, uh, all are called to belong to Jesus Christ. We all belong to the Lord. <clears throat> so I love that meaning of the word church. But in ecclesiastical terms, you know, uh, ecclesiastical terminology, the study of the church is literally called uh, ecclesiology. Um, hang on a second. My battery's getting low, and I'm going to plug it in. All right, let's keep going. Let's roll. Church, <clears throat> ecclesia, kalein in Greek <clears throat> is where we get the word call. We attach that prepositional prefix E or X to call out. We are the ones who've been called out. We have been called out. 
That's the meaning of this word ekklesia, literally. Okay, it's like an assembly or a congregation. It's used in the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament many times. Uh, how many? 77 times in the Old Testament. Uh, so it's not like it just got invented by the Christians, um, by our Lord here or by the, you know, it, it, it's all throughout the New Testament, but only twice in the Gospels. Only Matthew of all the four Gospels, he's the only one that uses that word church. And most notably here, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. And again in chapter 18 when he talks about, you know, confronting your brother with sin. And if it doesn't work, then take two or three others. If that doesn't work, take them to the church. It's kind of like a local sense of a local church dealing with some local problem. But in this sense here, it's clearly a universal sense of church. Um, so anyway, some instances of ecclesia you find in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 9.10, Joshua 8.35, 1 Kings 8.65, Nehemiah 8.2. All right, gates. Let's mention the fact that gates are defensive, a defensive posture, okay? Uh, the gates of Hades, when he says the gates of hell will not prevail against it, hey, gates are defensive. Gates of Hades means that we're on the attack, okay? Church is to be on the attack. Um, we're on the offense. Hades or hell is on the defense. Kind of cool to think about it that way. Um, uh, what's our primary weapon? The cross. So, um, let's now talk about the cross. You got the first here of what are going to be in Matthew's gospel, the most of any of the gospels, five explicit predictions of our Lord about his passion. First, he tells them, don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. He strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the messianic secret. And then he's going to tell them exactly what's going to happen to him. And I like Luke's gospel, 944. He says, let these words sink into your ears. Love that expression. It sounds like a parent trying to get through to their kids. Did you hear me? You are not going to that kid's birthday party or whatever the heck. Um, we don't want to hear it. He says it five times. They're just unable. It's unable to, to penetrate their brains. This mystery of our Lord's passion, death, resurrection, and ascension is just, is just cloaked in mystery. They can't fathom it right now. Our Lord knows that. But he tells them five times. Why don't we want to hear it? Maybe it's a defense mechanism. It just doesn't fit our categories, you know? They had their preconceptions of what was going to happen. Ooh, can I sit at your right hand and your left? You know, James and John. I mean, I don't know what their conception is, but they just aren't getting it. It really takes the Pentecost before they finally, the lights fully come on for these guys. Here in Acts chapter 1, our Lord's about to send into heaven. And they're still saying things in verse 6 like, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, they don't understand the nature of God's plan yet. They will at Pentecost. <coughs> Finally, they get it. It takes the Holy Spirit. So five times in Matthew's Gospel, he's going to say this. I, The denial that we're in. Uh, when he tells them this awful thing, they just, they can't hear it. They can't hear it. You know, it's like my mother when she was dying. You know, I just didn't want to accept it. It's like I was in a state of denial myself. A denial kicks in uh, with this. You know, there's a great scene in the movie We Were Soldiers that I really, really like. One of the best acting jobs I've ever seen. It's so profound. It's this black woman. She's the wife of a soldier who's killed in this battle in the LZ X-ray or whatever, the Iodron Valley. Of the, so anyway, uh, Hal Moore and um, Seventh Cavalry. And it's a great movie. We were soldiers, <clears throat> if you like that sort of thing. And 
the women are being told back home on base, in the base housing, uh, groups of these women are going around to tell some of the wives that their husbands have been killed. And they come to this one black woman's house. She comes to the door and she sees them and she immediately knows what they're there for. And she's like, mm -mm, mm -mm. and she just like stubbornly refuses to accept what they're about to tell her. And she's just like, mm -mm, mm -mm. and then she starts crying, trying to hold it together. And they're comforting her. And she starts to break down and she's crying and you can see it coming into her brain. And she's like still crying and saying, mm -mm. it is heart rending, heart rending scene. It's so well acted by that woman. She deserves an Oscar or whatever. Um, <clears throat> that's the denial. I think the apostles are really in here. Um, just don't want to accept it. Um, I just think that that movie Chosen, not movie, the television series, The Chosen, I think it's going to tweak a lot of people. Because, you know, there's movies, The Passion of the Christ, and even Jesus of Nazareth is good. Because it's three movies, short movies. But The Chosen, two whole television series, people have been really, well, <laughs> that's where they're at right now. Season two finished. How many seasons are there going to be? I wonder that myself. <clears throat> but <clears throat> when they finally get done with this series, The Chosen, people are going to be so attached to Jesus at that point. <clears throat> myself included and Father Christian, we are so into it. And uh, this Jesus is so powerful. He's really good. And... When he dies, <clears throat> it's going to rock people, I think, more than any other movie. or Because you've really journeyed and traveled with the disciples. And, and you're, I don't know, it's going to be a very interesting experience when this thing unfolds. Wow. I think it's going to hurt to see. So that might help us. Um, right now, you see the cluelessness of the apostles in season two of The Chosen. Like, uh, they don't know where this whole thing is going. Our Lord does. They don't. Um, but our Lord's been trying to tell them, not only just in those five passion predictions, but in many other ways. He's already been saying it. <clears throat> Back in chapter 9, you know, he's like, the bridegroom will be taken away, and then they will mourn or fast on that day. One day the bridegroom will be taken away from them. He's alluding to his passion. He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me back in chapter 10. Talking about the cross. He's already made mention twice of the sign of Jonah. Okay. What is this sign of Jonah business? Um, it's, clearly it's a reference to his passion, even if it is kind of hidden or cloaked. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> are you able to drink this cup that I am to drink? You know, when James and John come to him or their mother and, sons of Zebedee, turns to him, are you able to drink this cup that I am to drink? It's kind of like, you know, the baptism in Luke twelve fifty. Are you, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how constrained I am until it is accomplished, a baptism. Are you ready to drink this cup or undergo this baptism that I am about to be baptized with? Allusions to his uh, <clears throat> passion. Uh, the parables, some of the parables and other things he's going to say here, the parable of the wicked tenants, this vineyard, God, you know, the owner of the vineyard is God the Father, sends his servants. Finally, he says, let me send my son to listen to him. And they kill the son so they can get his inheritance. Okay, this is all allusions to the passion. Um, now, Take up your cross, our Lord's going to say. Romans 8, 17. Just listen to what St. Peter says here. St. Paul, I mean. <clears throat> we got to take up our cross, folks. There's no other way. So St. Paul makes it really clear. Yeah, we've received the spirit of sonship 
sonship, small s, and we cry, Abba, Father, you know, my Father and your Father. We pray the Our Father. Um, Abba, Father, Spirit himself, bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. There's no other way everyone will be salted by fire, Mark 9, 49. Everyone enters this kingdom violently, Matthew 16, 16. Um, Matthew, sorry, Luke 16, 16. Uh, Peter, maybe he doesn't understand the cross right now. Lord, don't, don't go there. You can't, you must not let this happen to you. But he will, he will. Same guy after Pentecost says <clears throat> these things. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, as it was not possible for him to be held by them. Acts chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. Okay, this is Peter here in the first sermon. God knew what he was doing. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God five times. Our Lord told him what the plan was. Um, so when he says this, he was there and heard our Lord predict it over and over time and again. It was clearly God's intention. This was all orchestrated by the Lord himself. Now in 3.18, <clears throat> what's he going to say to this crowd of Jews gathered in Solomon's portico? He's going to say, what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. So, hey, the Christ had to suffer. Luke 24, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember? Okay. Um, all these things must happen to me. All these things. Do you not understand that the Christ had to suffer? It was hard for the apostles to get this. Um, you foolish men and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So that It's not just Peter here. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The apostles, they just don't get it. Oh. So, we don't get it either. You know, here's a great... Uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul, as our Lord's going to say? What does it profit a man? This is great. Uh, that was a, the word of God has a peculiar efficacy. And this particular passage was used to great effect by none other than St. Ignatius of Loyola, <clears throat> founder of the Jesuit order. He uh, was roommates with a guy named Francis from Javier in Basque, Spain, okay, uh, northern Spain. I've been to both of their homes where they grew up, Loyola and Javier. So neat to think these guys in divine choreography wound up being roommates at the University of Paris. Ignatius was in a full-blown conversion, okay. Francis was not. He was a very worldly guy with lots of worldly ambitions, dreams, desires, and he would sit there and go on and on talking to Ignatius, who patiently listened to him, tell him about all the stuff that he was going to do and accomplish in his life. All these worldly plans and dreams. And uh, at the conclusion of with which Ignatius would just say, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? I'm sure that was irritating for Francis to hear raining on his parade, but it haunted him, planted seeds of doubt in his mind. And this guy, this roommate of Ignatius of Loyola would go on to become one of the patrons of the missions. <clears throat> his arm in the Jesu in Rome that he baptized countless people with. Incredible story. The power of that verse, when you hear that verse, whenever you hear that verse, and recall that story and think of that dorm room, University of Paris, and these two guys 
who have become these great saints and founders of the Jesuit order, the largest order in the, the whole church. Now, uh, it ends here with uh, this reference, the very end of the chapter, which is kind of interesting because it says, our Lord says something kind of mysterious. Not sure what to make of this. It says, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here. I mean, this is after he has said, the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. 1627. Um, so this incredible statement about our Lord's identity, he's going to come in the glory of his Father one day to judge the world and repay everyone for what they've done. Uh, who, who's going to do that? A man? Okay. Uh, he's God's Son, capital S. And <clears throat> the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And he says, in verse 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, uh, I'm not sure what this means. Um, it could mean the transfiguration, which is coming next, the beginning of chapter 17. Because our Lord says something like this in the other three synoptics, and in every case, it's followed by the transfiguration. So he could be referring to James, John, and Peter, who are going to be on the Mount of Transfiguration, they're going to experience the glory of the Son of Man coming or being revealed in his kingdom, the glory of his kingdom, so to speak, the glory of the Father. Um, so it could be the transfiguration, could be the resurrection. Not quite sure, folks, uh, about that. That's all I want to say about that. But thanks for bearing with me and hanging in there through this whole thing. And uh, next time, I'm sure it's going to be shorter than this one. But... Uh, God bless you for sticking it out to the end. Peace out.